This is Harsh Rules, I'm Ben Harsh, and today we're going to continue to learn to play Liberty or Death, The American Insurrection. Liberty or Death, The American Insurrection was released in 2016 by GMT Games and designed by Harold Buchanan. This game supports up to four players and takes from three to six hours to play. This is the fourth part in the tutorial series for this game, so if you missed the first three parts, I highly recommend you go back and check those out. Part 1 covered an overview of the coin series and this volume in particular. Part 2 taught how to set up the game. Part 3 covered game actions called commands and special activities. And now in this fourth part, we will learn about the winter quarters period that occurs at the end of every year in the war. As you may remember from the first tutorial, the Revolutionary War is based on a stack of campaign year decks, each representing a year of the conflict. The length of the scenario chosen determines the time frame and the number of decks players must work their way through a card at a time. While playing through turns, players will flip over cards on the top of the deck. The first card drawn is placed next to the deck as the active played card. The second card is flipped over on top and is considered on deck and is a preview of the next card that will be in play. However, once the winner quarters card is turned up, stop play and swap it out with the played card. This will initiate the winner quarters period. Now there is an option called Winter is Coming, where if all players are in agreement, you do not replace the event card with the Winter Quarters card. Instead, you play through the current event card and then play through the Winter Quarters card. This allows players to formulate a strategy now that they know Winter is Coming. This makes Liberty or Death play in a similar manner to other games in the coin series. However, it does eliminate the shock and awe value of a Winter Quarters card suddenly being revealed. Once again, it's up to players to decide which version they'd like to go with. Now, let's focus on the Winter Quarters card and the subsequent play actions that make up the Winter Quarters period. Remember the sequence of play section at the bottom of the game board? Below the Sequence of Play section is a flow diagram of all the steps necessary to complete the Winter Quarters period. Next, we will walk through the requirements for each box in this sequence. The first phase of the Winter Quarters period is to conduct victory checks. To accomplish this, players will need to review the appropriate markers on the number track and review the number of Patriot forts and villages on the game board. As a refresher, there are three objectives and multiple outcomes for victory in the game. The primary objective is to determine the outcome of the American insurrection. Victory goes to the side with the most colony and cities that generate influence that either support or oppose British rule. Progress towards this objective is recorded with the total support and total opposition markers on the number track. When one of these markers exceeds the other by 10, then that side has won the primary objective. The second objective is the European interests. To secure a victory here for the French or the British, the primary goal must be triggered and then one side must have scored greater casualties on the enemy. Casualties for each side are recorded on the number track with two markers. The French faction can win if they incur greater British casualties with the cumulative British casualties marker. The British faction wins if they inflict more rebellion casualties with the cumulative rebellion casualties marker. Finally, Patriot and Indian factions also have a secondary objective to decide the conflict of American expansionism. The winning faction for this objective must have three more villages or forts in play than their opponent. If none of the required objectives have been met, they continue to execute the Winter Quarters round. For the next phase, each player must first check their supply lines. For a faction's units to be considered in supply, they must either be in an appropriate space or in a space with the respective fort or village. 
For the Patriot units to be in supply, their units must be in the same space as a fort or in a city or colony with rebellion control. Any spaces with Patriot units failing to be in supply cost the Patriots one resource per space, or they lose one unit for every two units rounded down. For the French, their units must be in the same space as a Patriot fort, a city or colony with rebellion control, or the West Indies. In every space they inhabit where they are not in supply, they can move those units to a space with the nearest Patriot fort, or pay one resource per impacted space, or failing that, they can be removed from the board and placed in the available French forces box. For the British faction, their units must be in a British fort or a city with British control. If they're not able to meet these supply requirements, the consequences are that it costs the British one resource per space, or in each space not in supply, adjust the influence to opposition by one level. Now, if they can't afford to pay and the space is already at active opposition, then those units are removed from the board and placed in the British Available Forces box. Finally, for the Indian faction, their units must be either in an Indian village or in a reserve space. A quick note, if no village exists anywhere, they can place a village in one reserve space. Any units that fail to be in supply, the consequences are that it costs the Indians one resource per affected space, or those units can be moved to the nearest space with one village. Once supply lines are checked, it's time to collect income and adjust the resource markers for each faction. Let's review the rules of the game's economy and remind ourselves about the requirements to earn resources for each faction. For each base in play, a faction can earn resources. Base units, for the Patriots and the British, are forts, and they earn one resource for each in play. For Indians, this is villages. However, the calculation is different. The Indian player takes the total number of villages divides that in half and rounds down, and this is the number of resources they earn. Now the French do not have either of these units. Instead, the French player's funding is divided into two sections. Funding before the Treaty of Alliance is played, in other words, before they enter the war, and after the Treaty of Alliance is played, in other words, after they enter the war. Before the French enter the war, their primary means of funding is the number of naval markers they have in the game. The French player takes their number of naval markers, multiplies that by two, and that's the number of resources they earn during this phase. The remaining sources of French funding can only occur after they've entered the war. Next, control of the West Indies is a lucrative funding mechanism for the British or French if the French have entered the war. Whichever of these two factions controls the West Indies earns five resource points. The Patriots and the Indians do not earn anything for their side controlling the West Indies. Moving on to the next category, the Patriots, French, and British earn resources for controlling game spaces. The Patriots can get credit for all game spaces except the West Indies. To earn their resources for this, they take the total number of rebel-controlled spaces and divide that by two, rounding down. This number is the amount of resources they earn during this phase. The British and French players only receive resources for cities under their respective side's control. When the British or French control a city, they earn resource points equal to the population of that space. However, the British player cannot receive credit if that city is currently blockaded. Finally, the French player receives one resource for each level of French naval intervention they have in play. French naval intervention is basically the number of cities the French have blockaded with their navy. The French player receives one resource for each level of French naval intervention. So I'm guessing that now you've noticed the Indian player doesn't have a lot of revenue options. 
This is true and accurate because this faction lives off the land rather than the civilized world of commerce. When we get to the gameplay tutorial, you will also learn that this faction may conduct several of their actions for free, which balances out their expenses. In the next phase, the Patriots or the British can spend their resources to influence loyalty in targeted spaces. When the British spend resources to influence spaces, it's called rewarding loyalty. When the Patriots spend their resources to influence spaces, it's called Committees of Correspondence. Targeting a space requires a faction to have at least one of their game pieces there. Then that faction must spend one resource to remove each of the enemy's propaganda or raid markers. Once all the markers are removed, that faction can spend one resource to shift the influence one level in their favor. This shifting is capped at a maximum of two levels per targeted space. Once players have completed this support phase, you'll need to check the victory conditions again. It's possible that this shifting may have triggered the primary objective. The redeployment phase is split into a number of activities. Many of these have to do with leaders. First, consult the event card on deck. If possible, the first faction on the card must make a leader change. You can see here the leader progression for each faction in the game and the associated special abilities for each leader. Next, each faction may redeploy its leader to a space with the same faction's pieces or place that leader in the available forces box. Redeploying leaders is conducted in the following faction order, first Indians, then French, then British, and finally, the Patriots. Two notes, if a faction has progressed to their last leader in the sequence, then no changes are made. Also, the French faction cannot make leader changes until after the Treaty of Alliance. Now that we've finished with the leaders, it's time to check the British release date. This action is to release the regulars and Tories in the unavailable section in the available British forces box. When these forces are released is determined by the scenario that is chosen by the players. The release details are listed in each scenario's setup guide. For example, in the medium duration scenario, the British return to New York, the release date is the first winter quarters period after 1776. At this time, the remaining six regulars and six Tories are moved from unavailable to the available section of the box. The final step in this phase is to lower the French Naval Intervention, or FNI, level by 1. The French player will conduct this only if the FNI level is 1 or higher. To complete this action, the French faction must choose one blockade to remove and return to the West Indies. Any remaining blockades may then be rearranged to cities of the French faction's choice. In the next phase, players will be required to calculate desertion amongst the ranks of the Patriots and the British. The calculation for deserting unit types is 1 out of 5 in the following categories. For the Rebellion, these units are the Continentals and the Militia. 1 out of every 5 of these units will desert, rounded down. The first deserting unit of each type removed from the board is chosen by the Indian faction. The remainder are chosen and removed by the Patriots themselves. On the British side, the only unit type that deserts are the Tories at the same ratio of 1 out of 5 rounded down. For the British, the French faction chooses the first unit removed and the British select the remainder to remove. Once units are removed, they're placed in their respective Available Forces box on the game board. The final phase of the Winter Quarters period is for resetting the board and preparing for the next year of the war. This prep phase is completed in six steps. First, remove all raid and propaganda markers from the game board. Next, move all the faction cylinders to the Eligible Factions box. Then, move any units from the Casualties box to their respective Available Forces box. Following that, flip all activated war parties and militia to underground status. Essentially, make sure all octo-cylinders have the symbol face down. 
Next, reveal the draw deck's new top card. And finally, resolve any applicable event on the Winter Quarters card. Now you're ready to resume play for the next year in the war. Now, before we close, let's talk about Brilliant Strokes. Each faction begins the game with at least one Brilliant Stroke card. The French, as we've learned, begin the game with two Brilliant Stroke cards, one of the traditional Brilliant Stroke variety, and the second being the Treaty of Alliance. When a faction plays a Brilliant Stroke card, they interrupt the normal sequence of play by placing their card over the active event card in play. This action essentially cancels out the played event card and in essence replaces the text with that listed on the Brilliant Stroke card. However, playing a Brilliant Stroke card is only eligible under the following conditions. The faction playing the Brilliant Stroke is eligible. The first eligible faction has not yet taken their action. And no Winter Quarters card is showing. What makes things really interesting is that then another player can trump that Brilliant Stroke by playing their own Brilliant Stroke card. However, the player whose Brilliant Stroke is trumped does get their card back to play later, so basically their card is just replaced. Now, there are some limitations to the trumping. The French Treaty of Alliance can never be trumped. The Indian faction may trump any faction's Brilliant Stroke. The French can trump the British or the Patriots, and the British may trump the Patriots. However, the Patriots may not trump at all. So as you can see, trumping is not just used against the opposite side. There may be situations where you want to trump your allies as well. At this point, you should have a good understanding of how the Winter Quarters period works in the game. By this episode, you should also be able to play through a game of Liberty or Death, the American Insurrection, with your friends. However, if you can't find anyone to play with, there is another option. In the next episode, we will cover the solo rules for playing this game. Questions about this game, requests for future Harsh Rules game tutorials, and constructive feedback are all greatly appreciated. Drop a line in the comments section. To be the first notified when this episode and any Harsh Rules episode is placed online, please subscribe to this channel. Until then, I'm Ben Harsh for Harsh Rules. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next episode.